Uh, for starters, those of you who have already presented your capstones and passed your comprehensive exams, congratulations. Woo! Yay. <laughs> Good. Now all, you have to, now all you have to do is pass this course and you're gone. So, so congratulations so far. So at any rate, at any rate, um, uh, let, uh, we're on the home stretch here, right? We have tonight's class. Next week is officially finals week. Um, it's not really class, presumably a class week. It's officially finals week. Um, we're not going to have a comprehensive exam, but on the syllabus, we do have a, a, an assignment for a critical appraisal for the end of the semester. I've posted on the blackboard here, you see a little tab there says critical appraisal. I posted two articles, both of them involving children and electromagnetic radiation, and a description of how, uh, how we want you to interpret them. It's basically uh, one page description of what the report tells you, and then a series of questions about uh, 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 did they adequately describe the population they were using, uh, so on, did they, did they properly did they uh, uh, properly uh, uh, analyze the data and so on and so forth? So there are a series of specific questions, and I'll open it up so you can take a quick look at it. Uh, yes. Yeah, four. Actually, it said four. It says four assignments, but we did five. Right. And and because um, uh, I split it up a little bit because it just seemed yeah it made some no sense to split it up and just do four big ones, um, and uh, it shows two exams yeah. and it shows a class participation yeah. score. This the, it doesn't show a third exam, yeah. right? The 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 uh, uh, this cr this cr this uh, critical appraisal is going to be basically like the same thing as two homeworks. So I'll grade it as if it's two homeworks. Um, actually, what I was thinking about is the assignment asks you to interpret both of these, uh, 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 both of these uh, uh, documents, both of these uh, studies. I'm going to change that to, to give you the choice of uh, doing an appraisal on one or the other. And the trade-off there, and it'll be graded just like a homework. It'll be same weight as a homework. And the trade-off there will be that I'll post another homework after tonight that covers uh, a very simple question on vibration and a very simple question or two on uh, on uh, 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 barometrics, which we're going to discuss tonight. Okay, just not not anything real challenging, but something that at least that we've uh, we've uh, uh, examined it. And you got a chance to exercise your your brain a little bit using using the information that's in the powerpoints so it's not going to be real challenging so you got those two things left is going to be the the uh, uh the that a sixth homework and that critical appraisal you only have to do one of the two documents i'll change that uh the uh, that is that uh, the the other the barometrics and the vibration are going to be type of thing that you'll you're going to answer a question put a number in and so on and you'll be able to to uh uh, resubmit it as much as you want. The critical appraisal, you're going to get one shot. It's basically a you're going to create a document, you're going to upload it. So that's only going to that's one shot thing because I, you know, I I'll be grading until the middle of January otherwise. So so uh, seeing as how like many of you would take uh, take the homework and like do one problem and then like you know submit it and then do another problem and submit it and do another problem. <laughs> so so I have a list, list of ten or twelve submissions there. So, so I usually just do the last one or something like that, trying to figure my way around not opening all of them. But anyway, so that that's what's left for the semester. If you've, you've kept up with homework, I'm also, you know, I, I literally I want it. I know a lot of you struggled with the um, radiation. It's really it, uh, with the uh, non-ion radiation. It's really pretty uh, complicated topic. And I literally uh, started this morning uh, recording uh, solutions for that homework. Uh, so you could go back and take, give another shot at it. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I, I was on a roll and I started to do problem one, problem two, problem three. And I got through about eight of the problems before I uh, downloaded it and found that I was only recording the audio, not the video. So I have to restart. I actually have it here. You can hear me talking. That's what it's just playing. Uh, the protective equipment is in the classes. You have to work from a direct beam exposure to a 10.6 micron CO2 laser 
for a period of 30,000 seconds. So I'm That's literally reading the question and then, button, and then going through the solution. But I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll go back over that and do that again. I may, I may just post the audio for the per se questions to start. Maybe It may be of some use. So I'm not sure that it will be. But I will do that again. Any questions? That, that makes sense? Uh, uh, the last official day of finals is December 19th. So I made most of the work due on December 19th. I'm probably not going to start grading until the weekend. So if you really have to stretch it, you got the 20th, right? But at the official end of the semester is the 19th. And I really don't have much time after the weekend to submit grades. So it gets pretty tight there. Okie doke. So basically December 19th with a little bit of a leeway. Yes. But it, the description of what we're asking for is very clear. In other words, it literally asks you to, uh, uh, for each one, each one of about 15 or 20 questions, it asks you to uh, uh, say yes, no, or not applicable or something like that for each of the 20 questions and to, to, to uh, accompany that with a one sentence answer as well. So it's pretty clear when you read it, when you read it, you'll be comfortable with it. I don't think you'll have a problem with it. The, the more challenging part is it asks you to do up to one page a description of the study. Well, what kind of study was it? What did they do? Uh, what does it mean? Why, you know, what, what are the results? And so on and so forth. Just a narrative on what you got out of the study. Anything else? Everything's on there now, you said? Yeah, it's on there now, except, except it's asking you to do both of them. You know, you're only going to do one of the two in exchange for doing the extra, the sixth homework assignment. Okay. Should we move on? Any questions about the material besides besides assignment five? Oh, uh, uh, as we're talking about this, since we're we're kind of moving on from uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation, um, uh, here's a couple of uh, electromagnetic electromagnetic radiation meters. This is called an ELF. It's a popular kind of home item. Uh, this one is sensitive to frequencies from 30 to 300 hertz. So where would you use something like this, 30 to 300 hertz, right? If you're paranoid about your, your the, the electrical system in your house, which is 60 hertz poisoning you, or your power lines going overhead and so on and so forth, this is good enough for what you want to do, right? This is going to measure in that frequency range, oh, 30 to 300, but in, certainly in that frequency range. This device measured in the range of 30 hertz to 8 gigahertz, right? So what have we added on there? What kind of devices work in those higher frequencies that we might be interested in radiation? Cell phones, right. So this might actually pick up, you know, like the radiation from your cell phone, the microwave radiation from your cell phone going to the cell tower. Uh, what else? What's in here? Wi-Fi, right. wi yeah, Wi-Fi signal, right, exactly. So, and, mic and the uh, microwave ovens and so on. Where we weren't very successful, I think. I don't know if I did that with another class. We weren't very successful with a relatively inexpensive monitor, but this one actually will work. So I'm going to pass this around. And the key to using this thing is it, 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 it's reading in three axes, right? So if you're holding this thing and chatting and going like this, you're never going to get a stable reading out of this thing. So you need to, you know, either put it down on a surface, better if you, you know, cover up the bulb. But uh, the antenna, so it's better if you cover, you know, like put it on a stable surface. But if you need to, you can just put it down like that and wait for it to settle out, right? Or hold it in your hand uh, away from your body so that it's so that uh, it's between you and the source that you're investigating. And what you can do is like with your cell phones, is and you guys can try this on your own. I have to remember how to work with the freaking cell phone here. This new. Okay, why isn't it quitting this app? Okay, it should do that. It should let me quit this app. There we go. Okay. Let's see. And oh, no, I don't want that. Let's go to the phone. Okay, so right now. And there are a number of different units that you use on here. It's, it, by default, it uses millivolts. Of, millivolts are volts per meter. I'm going to change it to, I'm going to hit the unit, and I'm going to change it to 
uh, uh, microwatts per square centimeter. Oh, actually, what else we got here? Milliwatts per square meter. I get a nice number, nice, you know, like one digit number with three decimal places out of that. I'm going to put it down here. It's alongside my phone. I'm going to let it stabilize a bit, get my computer away from it a little bit. And right now it's reading six, nine, one, eight, nine, so on and so forth. I'm going to dial a number that I know it's not going to answer. And it's jumping up to 34. 16, 22, 33. I can definitely see an increase in the amount of microwave radiation when the phone is actually transmitting. Okay, so you're welcome to give this a try with your own phones or with your own devices. And also with this, if somebody wants to run over to an outlet or something like that, see if they can get a reading off an outlet, they can give that a try there. So here you go, pass that around. I'm sorry? The bulb? Uh, it's covering the antenna. It's protecting the antenna. It's got an antenna under there, and it's protect. The antenna is in, has, you know, it's a complex antenna. It's in more. It has it's more than one antenna in different axes. So if it was just sticking out of there, it might get banged around. I think. I don't think there's any other reason for it having having that sh that bulb shape over it. And in fact, if we were go only going to use an antenna in one axis, there probably would have been an antenna like you see out of, coming over radio or something like that. Just like your Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi, I could actually track where the Wi-Fi antenna is on this computer when Wi-Fi is operating. And I, I believe that there's two antennas, one buried in here and one buried in here across the top of this. So you can, you can see how much more intense the microwave radiation from those areas of this computer are. Okay, so let's get started. I just left the message. <laughs> They're going to freak when they, the entire thing I was talking about is recorded on the message of the company I retired from <laughs> on their emergency line. <laughs> They're going to freak out when they see it. <laughs> They're not sophisticated enough to have a, uh, to have a system where they're recording the, uh, the, the uh, uh, incoming number. Right. So, Let's see if they know who it is. <laughs> I can't. I just realized it because I had the sound turned off to avoid having to get it, listen to the ring, but I forgot to hang up. Geez, they're probably calling in to find out what's on the line. Okay, here we go. Well, part of it is is that when you're holding it in your hand, yeah. you're moving. It, you know, it's, it's reading in different axes, and you're literally you're chain. It's cha constantly changing the strength of the signal, how it's sensing the signal, and so on and so forth. So just the move in your hand. So that's why it's best to like have it like on mounted on a stand, or you know, on a on a desktop or something like that or just hold it as steadily as you can, right? And it'll stabilize a little bit better, but that's the nature of microwave radiation we have where this room is flooded with microwave radiation from beepers, cell phones, sensors in the wall, uh, 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 security cameras, uh, uh, device temperature sensors that are part of the building management system. I mean, nowadays, when you have sensors around, very often they're wireless now, right? You know, you know, if you get a home security system installed now, they don't run wires all over your house anymore. You have all of these various kind of devices that are communicating with each other. Your TV, your 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 Wi-Fi now, your your router now is your is your telephone, is your security system, is your TV feed, is your internet feed. So, and those microwaves are going all over the place. In fact, let me before I get here, since since I'm off on a tangent anyway. Let me just let me just mention something else interesting. So if I can't find it, I dropped it on my desktop. But okay, this is an article 
on a um, uh, hobbyist, an electronics hobbyist. And what he's doing is he's created a circuit that, that harvests radio frequency uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation out of the air. So in other words, this stuff that's flying through the air, this is energy, right? We joules per second and so on and so forth. It's energy that's, that's moving through the air. And our phones are, our phones are picking it up. Our, you know, if, uh, 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 if we have a radio, it's capturing that, si it's capturing that signal. And it's, that, that's an actual, uh, it's changing its signal into, uh, 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 into energy in the radio. And then it's amplifying that, right? And it's not, it's not using that to produce power, but it's taking that signal and sensing it and then amplifying it. So you can take that signal and convert it into, you know, whatever radio station that you're listening to. Same thing with kind of cell phones with digital information and so on and so forth. This guy is experimenting with building a device that actually harvests the energy from the microwave radiation and from radio frequency and radiation and stores it in a battery so that you can use it to power things. So imagine that. Now, now the, the, what he's doing here, literally, he has to he has to collect energy for a while just to get an LED to blink, right? So we're talking about. Uh, but remember, this is a hobbyist here, right? This isn't somebody. This isn't somebody commercially trying to you know create something like this. But imagine that if you have a very low power device, like nowadays, you know, like like the, a lot of the uh, Apple Watch and the other watches and so on and so forth. You know they have tiny battery in them. They last all day long. They they stay lit. You know, like they don't they don't they don't uh, shut down the display anymore. They leave that on, and they do all sorts of amazing things. You can even make cell phone calls from them without the phone if you have the cellular adapter built into it, right? So they're getting to uh, they're getting to take advantage of devices that can use less and less and less and less energy to do the function that you want from them. So who knows? Someday this may be a way to keep your wristwatch, you know, uh, running. Now, I, you, you older guys here that, you know, like that, at uh, my age, remember we used to have watches that used to run, <laughs> they used to run based on, your wrist, they had like a little flywheel in them. So as you, they, they, would, char they would charge or, you know, load the, the mainspring in the watch as you moved your wrist, this naturally during the course of the day. And of course you have, you know, solar watches and so on and so forth. So, I mean, this may not be that uh, outrageous, Let me just show you another one of these. It's really pretty interesting. And, th and, th and this actually, this is a great demonstration of the fact that these, 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 this, this energy, this electromagnetic energy is passing through us all the time. It's here, it's actually here. I think I have another one here. Let's see, that's interesting. Maybe the same thing. Yeah. I might be able to find it later. So okay, let's move on from that. And you guys that are playing around with that meter, let me know if you get an interesting result from it. And make sure you don't leave people messages. Pressure gauge. Okay, vibration. Which one's PowerPoint? There we go. Okay. Oh, it's already opened. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, vibration. Millions of workers are exposed to vibration. You've seen these guys on the street with jackhammers, with hand tools that vibrate, pressure washers, um, uh, 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 cab drivers in, in uh, uh, navigating the streets in New York. Um, uh, truck drivers uh, are subjected to enormous amount of vibration uh, in the heavy equipment that they drive. Backhoe operators, crane operators, uh, all of these, all, all of these different occupations are subjected to uh, 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 wear and tear from vibration in the equipment that they uh, work with, uh, 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 the uh, uh, tools they use to do manual work, and uh, and the, the devices they drive or they operate. Okay, so. Uh, you have people in manufacturing, construction, it's basically all industries at some point. So for woodworking, for instance, there's a, uh, an example of uh, you know, a woodworker using a hand sander to finish a uh, work, and there's a, there's a bus driver uh, or a truck driver that's operating a vehicle and a, and a 
action. So the main effects of vibration exposure. Uh, well, naturally, when you think about it, a lot of people use hand tools, for instance, that produce a lot of vibrations. So hand arm effects are one of the leading uh, 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 results. Uh, issues with hand, hand and arms uh, are one of the leading results from uh, excessive amount of vibration or excessive time operating vibration producing instruments in the workplace. Uh, motion sickness, you know, if you're in devices in a, in a uh, uh, vehicle or, or a device that actually moves around, uh, sometimes it can be just an annoyance. It can affect your vision, right? Um, it can affect your balance. It has whole body effects as well. It has a lot of, uh, it causes a lot of issues. It can cause you to, you know, have uh, uh, neurological issues, uh, uh, cardiovascular issues, and so on. And we're going to uh, we'll take a look at a few of these. <clears throat> so how do we measure, how do we measure um, uh, the, um, uh, how do we measure the intensity and the risk that's associated with vibration? So one of the things that we're interested in is the amount of displacement that's associated with the vibration. So is it the kind of thing that when it vibrates, it's moving a lot, great distance, or is it only moving a very small distance? That's gonna have an impact on, on how uh, uh, it affects a worker. Uh, the next thing is the velocity or the speed of the vibration. Is it going up and down very slowly? Or is it going up and down more quickly? And so on. And one of the most important things is the acceleration that's associated with uh, with that vibration. So think about this. You got if you have a, a simplest form of this, we might have you know a a, a thing with a, like a plane type thing, a, a flat surface, and it's vibrating up and down. But every time it goes up, right, it stops. So it's momentarily zero vo velocity. So from that point, it moves again. It's accelerating. So it's accelerating all the way down to the bottom, and then stopping and accelerating all the way back and accelerating. So that rate of acceleration impacts. Uh, the kind of effect that it has on a worker and the frequency is it is it 30 hertz or is it 100 hertz and so on and so forth okay and again that that uh, that and the harmonics from that can affect uh, you know a worker in different ways uh, hand arm vibration one of the main issues that we're going to be dealing with and whole body vibrations as well and there are other forms of uh, there are other uh, 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 body parts that are also as associated with that so this guy's this guy is uh, taking down the street with a, um, uh, uh, a chainsaw, enormous amount of vibration involved, enormous amount of control that he needs to make sure he doesn't have an accident with that, with that uh, uh, chainsaw. So one of the effects of experiencing that vibration over a period of time as he's working is his hands get numb, right? For instance, his hands get numb. And after a while, the noise, the vibration, that's whole body effects, makes him, uh, 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 can affect his vision a little bit, uh, can affect this judgment even, right? So what happens? You're working with a chainsaw, right? And all of a sudden now, you know, you've been working with it for three or four hours, and now what happens to your, uh, you're likely to having a, an accident. So it has a lot of side effects besides the actual physical damage that the vibration does. It, in, it, it really has a, a, a significant incre uh, increase in the uh, uh, risk of uh, having a accident uh, that's uh, not directly associated with vibration, but indirectly caused because of loss of attention and loss of loss of being uh, loss of motor skills over a period of time. Sometimes acute, like you know, you work, uh, your hands are getting numb as you're working, and sometimes long term from neurological and, and uh, 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 vascular effects that the vibrations have. Uh, hand arm vibrations transmitted from work processes into the workers' arms. And hands are taking most of the uh, the um, impact of that energy that's being transmitted because by operating hand power tools such as road breakers, hand guided equipment, powered lawn mowers, uh, holding materials processed by machines, grinders, guy hold, guy working at a grinder, uh, regular and frequent exposure to hand arm vibration can lead to permanent health effects. So some of these are temporary health effects. Some of them we're going to see are permanent health effects. Anybody work with tools that uh, cause? What what do you work with? Yeah. Jackhammer. Oh, jackhammer. No kidding. Okay, great. So, and how long? How long did you have? In other words, how, what kind of periods of time did you work? Did you work like continuously for four hours, or did you work for thirty minutes, take a break? I mean, it was the kind of work that like you'd you'd work for five minutes and then break, and then five minutes, or was it continuous? Yeah, to take breaks. Yeah. Did you notice effects from the vibration? You know, like what kind of stuff? Uh, mostly in the hands. Uh, 
Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So it's cha a change in the tactile feeling, yeah. fingers and stuff. Okay. Good. Yeah. And that that affects your that affects your control for other stuffs. So in other words, one of the things one of the things in a hygienist, uh, if you know that yeah you're dealing with a worker has to do very fine work, but then at the same time he has to do work that involves equipment that is going to cause a lot of vibration for an extended period of time. One of the things you might suggest to the guys, he does the fine work first and then goes to goes to the devices that are going to, that are going to have issues that are going to affect his uh, 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 tactile senses. Okay, uh, vibration of range is, uh, uh, symptoms collectively known as hand arm vibration syndrome, syndrome HAV, okay, as well as uh, specific diseases like carpal tunnel, because that's, of course, uh, anytime you're gripping things, if it's vibrating, you got to put more energy into gripping the thing. So, uh, 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 carpal tunnel and those kinds of things are also affect, uh, 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 caused by this kind of thing. Pain, distress, sleep disturbances, inability to do fine work, as we were just talking about. Uh, everyday tasks get difficult, so, such as a guy that's working with a jackhammer all day. If he's doing that work constantly over five or ten years or something like that, he may start to wake up in the morning and not be able to button his shirt when he gets up in the morning. He'll have that kind of effect on his ability to use his fingers. Uh, reduced ability to work. And, and, and the thing is, is that by the time it gets to the point where you really start to notice it, then you can start to get to the point where some of the effects are not recoverable. So that, and just like hearing loss, right? You, you, you're exposed to it for a while, 15 years, 10, 15 years. And then by the time you realize that you had significant hearing loss, it's not recoverable at that point. Unlike when you have a short term, you only work with that jackhammer for a day or two, you know, you recover from all of that. Uh, reduced ability to work in the cold. I think there's a slide in here in, uh, that describes for di different kinds of activities, the latency of some of these effects. So some industries, it might be 10 years before you start to see the health effects from vibration. Some, some might be only three or four years. Uh, reduce, reduce grip strength of my ability to work safely. Motor control. Uh, vibration may make it difficult to maintain control over the instrument and tool being used. Tactile problems, both short and long term. Uh, uh, hand on vibration, loss of sensitivity in fingers and hands. Okay, uh, motor control effects, uh, increased likelihood of accidents, decreased comfort level, uh, mental fatigue associated with uh, doing that kind of work that's, uh, that's very intense and you're stressing constantly. Okay, uh, so what do we wanna do to reduce these motor control effects? Uh, number one is avoid the exposure, right? So that a lot of times in this kind of work, that's not all that easy because you need to use that uh, uh, stuff to uh, do the work, but you may be able to substitute other kinds of tools, other kinds of devices. There's also protective equipment that's available for that kind of work. Did they give you special gloves, like shock absorbing gloves or anything? They didn't care, they just, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah, now just get out there. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be a wuss, just go out there and break up the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, they have, they have devices like shock absorbing gloves, cushioning gloves. That, will uh, help absorb some of that vibration. Isolate or dampen the vibration. Uh, uh, machine side changes can be made to the tool or the instrument, adding a better grip to the tool. In fact, the tool itself can have uh, dampening uh, uh, devices. User side, you can teach the workers how to grip it properly, get better working positions, not be in awkward, uh, in awkward positions. And also, like I said, we'll probably, I think in this, uh, we have a slide showing some of the gloves that you can use, some of the uh, PPE that you can use. Uh, accuracy in the skill motor task can be improved by increasing the time available to complete the task. In other words, uh, um, uh, make sure the guy's not rushing. Uh, tactile effects, uh, uh, loss of sensitivity of fingers makes it more difficult to make judgments of texture, weight, and form of the objects being handled. And in extreme cases, permanent damage can occur. Um, uh, reducing tactile effects, eliminate, mi minutes, uh, minimize exposure again, right? Uh, ensure proper recovery time. Okay, that's uh, especially the uh, neurological, cardiovascular uh, uh, issues. Uh, if you uh, uh, put space in rest and uh, recovery, uh, uh, it goes a long way to avoiding some of the long-term hazards. So, where do we see this before? Anybody remember where we saw this before? Yeah, cold, right? Cold, uh, cold exposure. So, what was what was causing this white finger effect? In when in cold, what was being affected in those fingers? 
circulation, right? The, the veins and arteries and the, and that are the blood supply to those fingers were being affected. That's why they're white. Same thing here. Uh, 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 Long-term exposure to uh, hand arm vibration uh, uh, can affect, especially in those fingers in the palm, you know, where you're, where you're, uh, uh, um, where it's being most affected by the vibration. Uh, over long term, can have cardiovascular effects that can cause those uh, 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 this kind of issue. And you get attacks. In other words, it's not always necessarily white, but every once in a while, when you perhaps when you go to sleep and wake up in the morning, you wake up and you have these white hands. Okay. So, yes. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think I. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do a search on the internet later on tonight, and see if I can find another picture with black hands instead. <laughs> That's a good one. I hadn't thought about that. Okay. Okay. I. Uh, you know. I, I. My guess is it looks white also because it's it's absence of blood. Right, reaching the skin, the, the top skin, so pale. It, it probably looked pale, right? But I mean, at that point, you know that like you're 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 affecting blood vessels in your hand, and and a lot of that kind of damage may not be recoverable. And so, stage one, stage two attacks occur only in the winter. Again, now they're saying here you're going to see that more frequently in the winter when you work with vibrating equipment, of course, because you're combining the effects, right? Your your uh, blood vessels are constricted from the cold. And you have the damage to these these vessels as well. Uh, stage four severity of the vibration syndrome and the interference with work, social activities, hobbies require workers to change their occupation. In severest forms, also advanced changes in the arteries of the finger, leading to complete obliteration of the articles arteries. So you wind up literally you wind up losing fingers. So here's, here is for vibration white finger factor. Here's the average latency for vibration induced disease for in this particular case. Uh, the white finger issue, okay? And you'll notice that uh, we got shipyard workers uh, that they often you know, they complain about t tingling, numbness, num numbness, blanching, and so on and so forth. The latency is 12, 16, nine years. For a chainsaw operator, the latency is only four years. For a foundry worker, and I'm not sure exactly what kind of work you'd be doing in a foundry that, uh, that involves uh, exposure to a lot of vibration. Right, but uh, uh, but you can see chainsaw operators at certain occupations where you really have these intense, uh, uh, where you, you're exposed to vibration every day and over a long period of time with fewer rest cycles because chainsaw operator your work your work is to cut things with a chainsaw. Okay, acceptance acceptance of vibration syndrome as industrial disease is hindered mainly because. Not every physician is trained to recognize. You go to a doctor, you show them your fingers are numb. You complain about your fingers being numb. You know, I, um, I don't know about you, but I, how many of you have gone to a doctor, complained about some physical effect, and have the doctor ask you, what kind of work do you do? One, I've never had a doctor ask me what kind of work I do. They've asked me, have you traveled outside the country? Right? They, they ask me other questions like that to try and, you know, narrow down. What, where my symptoms would come from. I have never had a doctor ask me what kind of work I do. And I worked with the hazardous chemicals, pesticides, I mean, the worst of the worst kind of, you know, like nasty stuff. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, no, not one of them has ever asked me about that. So I guess you got to volunteer that kind of stuff, right? You should probably tell them that kind of stuff. So, okay. So factors influence it. So you can go, you can read through this. These are the, the various factors that influence uh, hand arm vibration issues. Okay, physical factors like that, like the frequency and the acceleration of the vibration, uh, uh, biodynamic factors like things, the connection between you and the machine and so on, and, in, and individual factors. Maybe maybe the, the amount of time you get off between uh, activities that expose you to this, maybe age and so on and so forth, uh, uh, how healthy you are and things of that nature. Now, do you have a problem at work like this? Uh, well, how do you know, right? The, well, you, you have to, uh, as if you're a safety officer on a construction site in a factory or something like that, if you have workers complaining, normally what you do is you log those complaints. You want to log those complaints so you can see if there's a pattern. And if certain groups of workers, you know, are, you know, constantly complaining about the hands, uh, hands being uh, numb or, or tingling and so on and so forth, so you can intervene 
before it becomes a permanent effect. Uh, you, uh, the, okay, and, and also examine what kind of equipment that they use and be aware of the possibility of this being a uh, uh, issue. Is that, there's some flashing on, yeah, that thing's still flashing up there. It's this track, I keep seeing it out of the corner of my eye. I, I don't know if I'm going blind or if there's a, something wrong with the lighting in here. The the uh, the organ industry is particularly high, such as construction foundries. Yeah, so yeah, you really want to look at uh, uh, the, and also what industry group you're in, and, and being aware of whether or not that is an issue. Sometimes insurance companies will bring this up with you. Once a year, uh, 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 one of the companies I work with, once a year, they have with a rep from Liberty Mutual. They 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 were insured by Liberty Mutual. A rep from Liberty Mutual would come up to our office and it would never be the same rep. It would always be a different guy, right? Come up to our office and I would get a call and say, Tony, you need, we need you to talk to this guy from Liberty Mutual because we're renewing our policy and so on and so forth. And I had to sit with this guy for about two hours to explain to him what the hell it is we're doing. Because they would come up there, and we were we were doing like you know environmental work, uh, indoor air quality, we we're cleaning coils, cleaning cooling towers, doing Legionella disinfections, doing cooling tower rebuilds, doing you know, all sorts of different kinds of work, laboratory work, and so on and so forth. So it'd literally take me two hours to explain all the different things that we were doing there as he's feverishly taking notes. So presumably, if we omit something from that. Then potentially, when if we have an accident or something like that, we well, didn't tell us you did in the right part, but we weren't right. So we didn't write you uh, professional liability insurance. So you're you're screwed because you got sued or something like that. You don't want you don't want you don't want to over you don't want to scare them into not giving you a policy, but you don't want to omit you know kind of work that you do that might uh, wind up biting you later on. So literally, that you know that uh, uh, that's a great time for you to kind of assess for yourself. When, you have, when you're in a situation like this, where you have to explain to someone else what it is that your company does, that's a great time for you to start to think about, well, what is it we do on a day-to-day -day basis? And which of these things that are gonna be hazards to us? And a lot of times, you know, once you start working, you know, years go by and you never really stop to reassess. So I guess it was a pretty good thing that every once in a while, we would, uh, that we'd get that guy coming up there. Uh, and the other thing is it, it also ch affected our marketing. Because whenever he would ask me different areas of business, he would ask me what percentage of our new business is that, right? So if uh, if uh, in their air quality was five percent last year and then it went up to ten percent, we knew we were making money there. If it was ten percent last year and we only did two percent this year, you know, oh wow, what's going on here with this, right? So it, you assess your you assess your work and your business from a lot of perspectives when you stop and just sit back and take a, take a fresh look at things. So you got to measure this stuff. So how do you measure this stuff? What do you have in this? You have something in here, right? That'll that that. Uh, 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 let me think of what where uh, where you might. Now, for instance, when I take this thing, and I'm looking at I'm looking at a picture. Uh, I have some of my family members on a cruise now. I'm not with them because I'm with you guys here. So if I'm looking at a picture of them with a drink with a little umbrella in it, um. So I want to get a better look at that. It's a horizontal <laughs> picture, right? What do I do with my phone in order to see the, the, the picture horizontally? I turn it like that. How's the phone though? I turned it. What's it got in it? Uh, it's, got a gyro, yeah, it's got a gyroscope and it's got a compass in it, but it's also got accelerometers accelera, accelerometers in it, right? These devices that you see back there are basically accelerometers. They measure movement and acceleration. And you got them in your phone. You got at least, I think you got them in like two, like two or three axes or something like that in order to do functions like that. Like turn, just one is for turning that, but the phone, the apps in the phone can do many other things besides that, including there are, there are vibration apps in here. Hang on a second. I think I just downloaded one. If I can get to it. Here is a vibration app. So this is, okay, start. Not working now. I need to change the scale here. I'm not sure how to do that. Here we go. Right? So that's full time monitoring 
the movement, you know, like obviously since this is almost filling up the whole screen, that since I'm holding it like this, that's that scale is very narrow, is a very small range on that scale. But if I put it down here, I don't know if you can see any difference. What we really need is something that's really vibrating. And it's using the accelerometers in the in the phone in order to keep track of and record the the uh, uh, frequency and the intensity of the uh, vibrations that are being that are being sensed by the phone. I, I doubt it. No, no. I, in fact, in fact, one of the other apps I have on here, one of the other apps I have on here is uh, they have a, a NIOSH has a whole series of apps, including they have an app for. Uh, for a ladder safety, where it goes through all the different points of inspection that you need when you get, have a ladder fall, you tell it what kind of ladder it is, and it goes through all the different points of inspection you have to do daily. You can log it and so on and so forth. Not only that, but it uses the the, the level and the accelerator accelerometers in here, so that when you put the ladder against the wall and put the phone against it, it will tell you what angle it is and if it's in the correct range for an angle on the wall. Yeah. So yeah, check out Ni Google NIOSH and uh, and phone apps and stuff like that, and you'll find a whole series of them. Uh, I don't think they have one on for vibration. If they do, uh, I, I didn't notice it when I was going through the app store. But they may have them. But they certainly have it for ladders, a whole bunch of other uh, processes as well. And um, uh, they have they have a slight they have a version of the NIOSH lifting equation. It's an abbreviated version. It doesn't have all the factors in it. They have an abbreviated version of, of, of the NIOSH lifting equation that they publish also, and that's from NIOSH. Okay, so those have accelerator on, accelerate, uh, accelerometers in it. 20 years ago, these things were big, fat boxes that, that, that you couldn't use. I mean, how do you stick this on the guy's hand while he's you know, using a jackhammer or something like that or stick it on the device and not affect how he's doing his job? Nowadays, they're so tiny, and remember also that you know this is this can be effect this the move this movement can be in any of three axes, right? Nowadays, there you go. Sensors, the sensors on the handle connects to a device that's uh, taking the measurements. So the sensors are little specks. In, you know these accelerator accel accelerometers are little tiny devices that are embedded in this phone, and naturally now you can you can take advantage of that. And now you can put that on that on that handle or that device, whatever it is, and the and, and the worker can literally do his work while you measure the actually frequency, the velocity, the the uh, uh, acceleration that's associated with that vibration in that device to make a judgment about how, you know uh, how often he should take breaks, what kind of hazard, what kind of hazard it is, and so on. Okay, yeah. So measuring, you have uh, you have a whole bunch of tools now that you can use for that. Here you go. Here's the guy's literally holding it between his fingers. Okay. Oh, how about this? Uh, motorcycles. Um, um, California Highway Patrol. Chips. Remember they have a TV show on called Chips, right? So they 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 don't. They spend. I think they used to spend six months riding Highway Patrol on motorcycles, and six months off on other duty, and then back six months back on. Why? Because they were being affected. The, the fat was being shaken off their kidneys and so on and so forth. So they're, they're whole body, that whole body effects from these motorcycles because they were on them constantly going, going front, you know, patrolling eight hours a day. So if you've ever been in a motorcycle, there's plenty of vibrations going on on a motorcycle. Okay. Uh, some are not so bad, but, uh, but certainly is certainly a lot of stuff going on. These guys, the guy with the computer there is using sensors on the bike to measure when, I guess, what they are doing while it's idling. He's taking measurements on how much vibration there is on the bike there. Okay, uh, uh, has, uh, now there's no specific OSHA standard, but of course, other organizations that have a, a little bit more of a free hand have put together uh, guidelines and recommendations. For instance, ACGIH has a, a threshold limit value for hand arm vibration and whole body vibration. I think the last slide here is gonna be an example of that. And here, this is, this is a formula that describes how much time uh, you should limit the activity to based on exposure time and the uh, the vibration acceleration. Okay. And in fact, we're going to be looking at a table here just uh, momentarily. Here's a drill, a power drill. Okay. And okay. Engineering controls, uh, production lines, uh, uh, engineer to minimize the need to use 
uh, uh, hand tools or vibrating hand tools, use other kinds of devices. Uh, the recommendation tools, man, uh, manufacturers should modify and redesign tools to reduce hand-on vibration. Uh, more research, uh, workers using vibrating hand tools should, be, uh, should communicate the symptoms that they have from vibration syndrome to their employer. employer. And workers should see a physician promptly if they experience prolonged symptoms of tingling, numbness, or signs of blanched or blue fingers. And, and uh, uh, so that's a key there because you want to intervene before the health effects are permanent. Uh, health effects, particularly occupational physicians, should be trained in the appropriate clinical examination and interview necessary. But all doctors really should. I mean, that's literally, I mean, when you fill out, when you fill out the three pages of crap that they make you fill out, before you'll see, before you can see a doctor, are you allergic to this? Are you allergic to that? Do you do this? Have you have you had surgery? Have you had this? Have, now I don't remember seeing a question on here. What's your occupation? Right? And think about that, right? So, so and I mean, a lot of people have hazardous occupations, occupations that, that expose. E even, for instance, a nurse going to a doctor, a nurse that works in infectious diseases, right? Well, that should be communicated to a doctor. I mean. If she gets sick, she has a, she's a, her exposure is to uh, is, uh, to a much greater variety of uh, organisms than a typical person would be. Work around horses, West Nile disease. If you work uh, with reptiles, salmonella, and so on, right? Pet shop. Yeah. Well, most of the time, most of the time, most people don't work in companies that have a company doctor. There are some, a lot of, uh, there are, you know, you work for the, the MTA, you know, you go through, a, you know, if you're a, you're a conductor or you drive the train, you, you're required to take an annual physical and they have their own doctors. And of course, they're aware of the kind of hazards that are associated, what they need to look for and so on and so forth. But most people go to their own private physician. They don't go to, you know, and private physicians never, at, never seem to ask, even on the intake forms. Never seem to ask what your occupation is. Anybody been in an emergency room recently? Fill out the forms. Uh, did they ask your occupation in the emergency room form? They they did. There you... Oh no, kidding! I, I don't want to invade your privacy, but were you there for something that he thought might be associated, or just r routine? Oh, okay. What what you want to tell us? You don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to if you don't want to. Though. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there you go. And and what kind of work do you do? Um, Equipment. Oh, okay. There you go. So you went in there complaining about back pains or arm pains, and so that's a natural. He's going to ask you, well, what are you what are you doing? There's an old comedian. One of his one of his typical. Uh, anybody here ever heard of Henny Youngman? Right. One of his classic. Like he was kind of one of these Catskill comedians. Right. One of his classic jokes was, "Doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do that." Doctor replies, don't do that. Right. So, so at any rate, hey, listen, he's been dead for 40 years or something like that. He's still getting laughs. Personal protective equipment, many types of gloves. Here, here's a, for instance, here's a type of glove that will absorb shocks and so on. So where you can see the padding on there. And you can, you can imagine that this is going to take, going to reduce a lot of that effect from that vibration as far as your finger, at least at locally, as far as your fingers are concerned, maybe not whole body though. Uh, so here's uh, 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 various issues that can, various parts of your body that can be affected. For instance, this might be simulating the areas of a, dr a truck driver's body, cross-country truck driver's body might be affected by vibration, uh, constant vibration from being on the road. And these guys drive, you know, they might drive 15 hours at a time, you know, with only taking like short breaks, you know, uh, uh, a couple of short breaks. Uh, okay, fatigue, irritation, motion sickness, we went through all that. Okay, so here, you know, we have, let me go back to this one here. So, uh, play current slide, here we go. Okay, so here we have a chart. Uh, this was produced by a ACGIH, and um, it uh, upper boundary has health risks are likely. Uh, the area between that solid line and the dotted line is an area where you have potential health effects and should have caution, should be cautious. And that low, below that lower boundary is you don't really expect to have health. Your most people will not have health effects. Not everybody. It's just always, it's always yeah, we're always looking for uh, protecting the bulk of workers because there's such a wide range of 
physical capabilities and size and everything else that it's very hard to uh, put together a program that's adequate for everybody. But let's say, for instance, that the uh, weighted acceleration is um, 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 uh, the weighted acceleration in meters per second uh, per second squared. That's an acceleration. Is uh, uh, is 0 0.7 is 70 is, is 0 0.7 uh, uh, meters per second squared. And if I go across from there, right? And uh, let's say that I uh, let's see what happens if the worker is working for an eight-hour day. So I'm going to go across from there. That's about there, about there, about there. So here we are: one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, seven hours, eight hours. He's in the he's in the eight hours is there. He's in that caution zone, right? So so we want to maybe reduce the amount of exposure, not make him work for eight hours a day. Let's get. Well, we would have to, if we want to get him out of that zone, we would have to make sure he's not working more than, say, about uh, three hours a day doing that activity, right? So this is a chart you can use if uh, you use that use that accelerator accelerometer to measure the the uh, nature of the vibration. This is a chart you can use to say to yourself, well, this is how I'm, this is what I need to do to limit this guy's exposure so it reduces the chances of him experiencing whole body effects. Okay, cool. The last thing I want to cover is pressure. Okay. Pressure. Who does that song? Is that the Kinks? Uh, David Bowie's Pressure? Is that the, no, is it? I thought it was the Kinks. No? Am I wrong? <laughs> now you're going to make me look it up. Hang on a second. That never, there's always time for, for uh, learning something. Pressure. I'm going to put in kinks first. Uh, there must be David Bowie probably does another version. Let's try David Bowie. Pressure, pressure, Oh, we got David Bowie. Oh, Queen and David Bowie under pressure. Oh, they have. They, I guess they covered the song or something like that. It's a different song. No, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, oh, under pressure versus pressure. Okay. Right. Two different names. Okay. All right. So, hey, listen, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So you have to do this stuff, everyone. You have to take a break and do this stuff every once in a while. So let me, what's that? You're checking it out. You got to check that song. Hey, listen, I watch TV. I watch movies and TV with Shazam on my phone constantly. Okay, let's talk about pressure. So we got two issues with pressure, too much and too little, right? So for starters, let's think about this. Pressure is one of the elements that we're concerned about when we have a lockout tagout program, right? Because things that are under pressure, that's stored energy. And you're going to have an enormous amount of stored energy, right? Could be cylinders, could be oxygen cylinders, could be uh, 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 even uh, fire extinguishers, could be uh, all sorts of devices, pneumatic devices, uh, hydraulic devices. They are all uh, containing an enormous amount of pressure. And when that pressure is released, it can be very dangerous. So, so we have uh, situations where uh, we have devices that contain high pressure that if it's released suddenly can cause injury, can cause serious injuries, really dangerous stuff. Well, what about low pressure? Well, low pressure, we have uh, workers that work at elevations that work, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, in aircraft, in uh, device, in uh, locations where the elevations are very high, you know, like uh, uh, on mountains, vul 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 vulcanists, and so on and so forth, that are uh, working at very high elevations. Climbers and things, geologists, they're working at elevations. So low pressure 
is can be an issue as well because then you have issues with uh, having sufficient gases that you need in order to survive, mainly oxygen, for instance. Okay, other gases too, but mainly oxygen. Uh, so we have low pressure is an issue. Too much pressure is also an issue as well. So where do we come across situations where we could be in an environment where the pressure is, is too low? Okay, so by the way, anybody know what 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 altitude that the FAA requires civil, commercial, and uh, 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 civil, com civil, commercial, and all aircraft, all private aircraft, to uh, have be equipped with oxygen? You know what that altitude is? What do you think? 10, 10,000 feet. Okay, now 10,000 feet, people live at 10,000 feet pretty comfortably, you know. Uh, if you go, if you were to visit something at 10,000 uh, 10, feet and, uh, and take, you know, like a bus up a mountain or something like that, or drive up a mountain or something like that, you might experience some discomfort when you got up there. I mean, you guys are mostly young and pretty healthy, so it wouldn't be a big deal for you guys, but you might experience some discomfort, but it might be distracting, might affect your judgment and so on and so forth. So if you're operating an aircraft, if you're at 10,000 feet, most, most people will go to oxygen under 10,000 feet. But if you're at 10,000 feet, the FAA absolutely positively requires that you be on oxygen at that altitude. Okay, so let me go back to this. Okay, so, uh, so high pressures, we have also another issue with high pressures. And where do we wind up seeing uh, uh, people working in elevated pressures? Divers, uh, people working on oil rigs that uh, that are offshore oil rigs, and so on and so forth. Uh, welders. Uh, 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 we have people that work on bridges and tunnels, right? Yeah, they work in caissons, right? They work in these devices that are basically giant cups uh, that are pressurized with air that are pushed down onto the ground. So they're literally uh, maybe 60, 70, 100, 200 feet below ground. But the water is kept out of that caisson, out of that work area, by being having that caisson pressurized so that the water can't leak into. It. So they're working under pressure. What's that? That sounds terrifying. That sounds terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you know the guys that are working on the on the uh, subway tunnels now. They they are. I don't think they pressurize the areas. That, I don't think they need. They may need caissons in some areas. Right where they have uh, groundwater and stuff like that, but for the most part, some of those, some of that water tunnel is 300 feet below the ground. You have to take a, you have to take a, a, a construction elevator down into this tunnel that, like your next access out, is like you know a couple of miles away or something like that. And they're subway-sized tunnels. You know they have, you know they run tra little trains, mini trains through them and stuff like that. So, so uh, uh, yeah, it can be a little bit weird and confining. The caisson doubles that with the fact that you're in an environment with that you're basically breathing uh, air at high pressure just like a diver would just like a free diver a uh, a uh, scuba diver would uh, i have a i have a cross section up oh, there's a water tunnel right there you go there's a caisson right so the caisson's got this one this one's not very deep Right, it's got an it's got an elevator here, actually an elevator or stairs, an emergency stairs, and they shuttle the guys down there. They do the work, and they compress air is compressed in here so that the water can't come in to the uh, bottom of the caisson. So just imagine a cup turned upside down and pushed down. If you push it down far enough, the pressure will start to build so much that it'll compress the air, and the water will start to come up into the cup. So you need to pressurize the air in there to push the water back down the further down you got to go you go the more pressure that you need to keep the water out of that inverted cup that they're working in and then they pull that up move it to the next spot so that's the way they build foundations for bridges that's the way the brooklyn bridge was built so problem is is that now you're dealing with surface air that they pump down there fresh surface air they pump down there that's under enormous compression that's under a lot of compression many several atmospheres let's say Right. So what happens then? Just like a diver, you can have nitrogen narcosis, right? Because you're dealing with the same amount of nitrogen that's in the uh, air at the surface. However, because the air is compressed, there's more of it per, there's a more of a mass per unit volume of the air. It's compressed, right? So that means that the partial pressure of the nitrogen is higher. 
So more of it's going to dissolve into your bloodstream. It's going to wind up in your bloodstream. Well, what does that cause? That causes nitrogen narcosis, affects your judgment, uh, 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 and can even be deadly in some cases, right? So not, that's a problem. Then, now that this nitrogen, if you spend an extended period of time down there, this nitrogen gets dissolved into your bloodstream. Uh, I, nitrogen is a, a bigger issue than most other gases. Why? Because there's more of it in, in, more of it in the air. So, you, you, so that's really what winds up being the gas that's most dissolved in your bloodstream. So this winds up getting dissolved in your bloodstream. Now, if you leave the caisson, go back up on that elevator, you are back at uh, one atmosphere. And what happens to the nitrogen that's in your bloodstream? It comes out. Well, hopefully it comes out gradually. It comes out through your lungs. When it hits your lungs, you, it, 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 uh, it, uh, the excess nitrogen is lost. You, know, you, you, you respire the excess nitrogen and you get rid of it you don't want it coming out in your bloodstream. Because it comes out as bubbles in your bloodstream, they can cause embolisms. They can block you know, important arteries or, and cause embolisms in your lungs and so on and so forth. And it can, be, it can be enormously painful if it's in like muscles and things like that. Enormously painful. And, and it's, it, it's very dangerous as well if, if it winds up uh, blocking flow to an artery that's supplying your heart or your lungs or something like that. So you It, it depends on the depth. Yeah, no, yeah, the answer to that is yes. They have to, they have to be cognizant of the same thing. Now, divers, they have a little bit of an advantage because they can change the mix of gases and the uh, uh, air that they're using. They don't have to necessarily use plain everyday air that, uh, that we're using. So they can change the mix of gases, right? So they have a little bit of an advantage, but they really have the same problem, right? Because they're under, their, under that pressure of breathing this so, so, uh, and there, that there, that's a dangerous, even more dangerous situation than being in this case on. I mean, being in this case on uh, really has basically all the same dangers that any kind of excavation would have, right? Construction or excavation. When you're a diver, you're in really a completely alien environment. So it's really, really dangerous, and like comes to kind of lose your judgment or balance or something like that when, when you're diving. So yeah, so the, the one of the ways you deal with this is by uh, limiting the amount of time you spend at depth and by gradually coming up so you respire out the, a lot of the nitrogen gases, but a lot of times you can't, you can't do it that quickly. You've got limited air supply, right? So, so uh, and issues happen. So what do you do if somebody is having an issue with nitrogen, uh, with the bends, basically, with this, this issue with that? Right, to put them in, they put them back under pressure. So it redissolves the, uh, the uh, uh, nitrogen in the bloodstream, and then it's, it's slowly, they very slowly uh, uh, bring them back to a normal pressure. But yeah. Well, the top of the caisson, it, it, you know, it could be, it could be that the caisson is at the surface, right? Or it could be that this is weighted, and they have there's another there's another access to this this chamber here. Where they take the elevator or the stairs down to the main work area depends on the it depends on the project and the depth. Uh, the where's one of one where's one of the first places in New York City that they employed caissons in the major construction site? What's well, bingo? The Brooklyn Bridge, exactly right. And they had dozens of workers that died in the caissons from the bends. And in fact, the the um, the son of the designer, it was, I'm trying to think, John Roebling. Uh, John and William Roebling, I think, were the father and son that designed and built the Brooklyn Bridge. What's that? And to say, yeah, I don't, I don't remember which was which. I think it was John and William. Uh, uh, William Roebling, when they started to uh, 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 select locations for pilings, his foot was crushed in an accident with a tugboat they were using, you know, uh, that got trapped against the, uh, a pier or something like that. And he developed tetanus, and he died before they started construction. His son took over construction of the bridge. They both were engineers. And uh, literally, within the first couple of years of construction, he was working in the caisson. He got the bends. And, and uh, he was unable to go to the job site from that point on. His wife, he would watch the job site from their apartment in Brooklyn Heights, and his wife 
was in charge of construction. He would, you know, shuttle the instructions and the work orders and stuff like that back and forth. And there's a couple of great books. I think one of them is called The Bridge, literally called The Bridge, right? But uh, literally, they lost. Uh, anybody, if somebody wants to Google it, I don't want to, I, I'm already getting off topic too much here, right? So if somebody wants to Google it while you're out there, uh, just see if you can find like uh, uh, Ben's deaths from Ben's on the Brooklyn Bridge. But they had, they had, they lost a lot of workers specifically from pressure issues on the Brooklyn Bridge, yeah, working in the caissons in Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, so uh, human body can function within a, a reasonable range of pressures, limited to the rate of change you can tolerate. Mostly it's limited, limited to the rate of change that it can tolerate. Uh, many pro uh, products, processes involve elevated pressures, um, uh, but we really, uh, we really can't tolerate very uh, dramatic releases and changes in pressure. So low pressure environments defined by those that have pressure less than sea level. So how do we define sea, uh, pressure at sea level? 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's literally the weight of the atmosphere above us, pressing down on us. When you look at a gauge in a machine room, it says zero, right? But the real pressure, which is all around us, and this is what we would call static pressure. When you're talking about a duct, that, that would be the equivalent of static pressure in a duct. The real pressure that's all around us, inside in our lungs and so on and so forth, which, is, which we literally uh, uh, live, or live within, right, is 14.7 pounds per square inch of pressure pressing on us all the time. But we don't notice it. We don't sense it because that's our environment. That's, where we've, uh, that's how our bodies have adapted. The equivalent of that is 700, the same weight of that, the same pressure. But so think about this. It doesn't matter when you measure pressure at the bottom of something, like whether it's an atmosphere or a swimming pool. It doesn't matter how wide that body, body of water is. All that matters is how deep it is. That determines what the pressure is. So the width means nothing. It's all about the pressure. The equivalent pressure in mercury, which, which we use in barometers and other devices because it's, so, it's a liquid and it's very dense, uh, so we don't need that much of it to emulate. Uh, 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 atmospheric pressure. The equivalent is having 760 millimeters or 76 centimeters of mercury in a column, right? And old barometers used to have, you know, long tubes with filled with mercury and so on and so forth. So where do you see mercury the most? Where's the only place now that you you see mercury anymore? Yeah, it used to be in switches, used to be in pressure gauges, barometers, and stuff like that. Where's the one place you still see it occasionally? Old, old school doctors, right? Old school doctors would use what to measure your, your uh, blood pressure? Speaking of pressure, speaking of pressure, uh, uh, some of you guys work in medicine and stuff like that. When they put that cuff on your arm, how do they know what your blood pressure is? Anybody have any idea how they do that? How do they know they put that cuff on your arm? They're like looking at a gauge and looking at, looking at a gauge. Not everybody knows this. Go ahead, explain it. <laughs> right. Okay. This is informative, but go ahead. Well, first of all, when you when you put the pressure on, it stops blood flow to your arm. Right. Okay. Right. So that's what they're doing. They're literally measuring the pressure of the blood in your arm using that cuff. And how do they know what the how do they know what the pressure? How do they know how much pressure is in that cuff on your arm? How much pressure is exerting? Right? Well, they have a gauge on it, right? Nowadays they have a digital gauge on it, right? But if you go to an old school doctor, what's at the other end of that cuff? A mercury column. A column of mercury, and he's pumping it. When he's pumping it, what's happening to that mercury column? It's going up, and he's watching that mercury as it's coming. He's watching that mercury column. When he hears the first beat, he sees where it is. What's the best thing about that mercury column versus a digital instrument versus an analog instrument? What can I depend on with that mercury column? What do I not have to do with that mercury column? 
calibrated. I don't have to calibrate it. It's the height of Mercury. Nothing that unless the Earth changes orbit or gains like mass, nothing's going to change. That's always going to be the same, right? It's going to be like that that height of Mercury is going to be the amount of pressure. So yeah, so so 76, 760 millimeters Mercury is the same thing as atmospheric pressure. Is it always that pressure? Well, no, because warm air is lighter than cold air. So when we get a warm front coming through, what happens to the pressure of the air? The barometric pressure goes down because we got light air on top of us or heavier air. So a barometer will notice that. And a barometer will only notice that over a course of a few millimeters up or down, right? Because that's the amount of variation that's based on that. On that. That's, and that's one of the reasons why you, they used to use barometers of weather, weather uh, predicting devices because as a warm front would come through, it's more likely you're going to get precipitation. So that the barometer would go up, yeah, the front would go uh, would go up because it's not, or down, and then the cold front would come through, go up, and then like that would indicate that like this cold air coming in and going to condense more. I don't even remember exactly how it worked, but at any rate, I don't remember media. And I took a meteorology course once a long time ago, but yeah, 760 millimeters is the average pressure on Earth. Okay, and for, it's equivalent to 14.7 pounds per square inch. But we have other ways of measuring that as well. We can just describe that as being an atmosphere. So, it, you know, uh, if we're under pressure, if we're if we're down under the water um, and the pressure is higher, we might describe that pressure now as being two atmospheres. So what is the equivalent in the height of water for 14.7 pounds per square inch or 760 millimeters? What's the equivalent? How much? Yeah, right. Closer to 33. Yeah, they're 33 in a fraction or something like that. So if you go if you go underwater and you're 33 feet underwater, how much pressure in PSI are you exposed to right now? Right? Remember the, the column of 33 feet of water is 14.7 PSI. So you're exposed to 14.7 from the atmosphere, so 14.7, you know, for that extra body of water. So now you're exposed to two atmospheres or 29.4 psi, absolute, right? Including the atmospheric pressure. Right? Yeah. Well, it, 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 when, it, when we got when we go and do some other calculations, and, and those can, and we want to start to calculate changes in volume and temperature and pressure. We might be interested in absolute, you know, be, because because we're dealing with a existing pressure and we're changing pressure. We might have to deal just like we deal with absolute temperatures when we work with changes in volume based on changes in temperature or pressure, right? Then we would probably want to work with the absolute pressure as well, not just the gauge pressure. But in real life, if you're a boiler operator, you don't care about the atmosphere. You just look at what your gauge is saying. I just, yeah. So so in industry, you're mostly just interested. But as scientists, when we're working with calculations that involves uh, uh, pressure, volume, and temperature calculations, uh, we have to work with the absolute volume, the absolute, actually the absolute pressure and the absolute temperature in order for those formulas to work right. So at any rate, so one of the ways that we can examine how we're being affected by nitrogen, by oxygen, and so on and so forth, is this law of partial pressures. So at, um, uh, do I have an example here? So for instance, if if we were to be if we were to go down 33 feet underwater, uh, and we wanted to um, uh, that so now we're at two atmospheres, right, uh, uh, of pressure, and we want and we have 21% oxygen in the air that we're supplying, like for a diver or something like that. What's the partial pressure of that gas? of that pressure of the oxygen now. Well, it's the yeah, number of atmospheres, which now is two times the amount of oxygen. Even though you're 33 feet, it's now, you're including the one atmosphere, plus you're adding another atmosphere to it. So that's two times the percentage of the gas, which is uh, uh, 21. Uh, so the partial pressure is 44, well, 42. So now keep, keep in mind, that if I had ignored the initial pressure, it just would have been one, so it wouldn't have it wouldn't have corrected for the extra pressure from the water. Okay, so low pressure envi environments, um, 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 sea level 760, uh, total pressure at um, at 10,000 feet is uh, 523. Partial pressure of oxygen 
for standard gas, uh, uh, standard gas, like in other words, air, just regular air. At uh, sea level, the partial pressure for oxygen is 132 millimeters. The percentage of uh, uh, 760, that is oxygen, 21%, right? Well, what happens to it at 15,000 feet? Well, it's down to 88, the partial pressure is 88 millimeters of mercury. So if there's less pressure in the oxygen, there's less that's getting dissolved into your bloodstream and available to the hemoglobin that's going to deliver it to your body. And what's the what's the altitude for uh, um, uh, Everest? It's like 29,000 feet. So at 30,000 feet, the partial pressure is 40, about 46 millimeters <coughs> compared to uh, 159. Uh, uh, it's about a, it, you, you have about a third of the amount of oxygen present that uh, available for you to breathe. When you're on, when you're making that last push on Everest, and that's why a lot of people don't manage to come back from that. And notice how the partial pressure goes up as you go down. For oxygen, it means that there's more available oxygen. But then with nitrogen, the other issue is that there's more available uh, nitrogen as well. Effects of oxygen deficiency caused by low pressure are delayed by increasing the oxygen content of the breathing gas mixture. Like I said, divers and workings and casings and so on and so forth. Uh, and well, may not so much work as in casings because of the volume of air. But divers, for instance, can uh, 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 can affect can, can counteract the effect of the pressure by increasing the the by tailoring the gases that they use uh, and not using just plain normal air. Uh, physiology, uh, body has the ability for, uh, yeah, breathing as we uh, it's a less oxygen available or the partial pressure of oxygen is lower. Our breathing rate goes up. Our heart rate goes up. Um, uh, and if you're long term, what happens long term? If you live in an environment or you train in an environment where the partial pressure oxygen is lower, you acclimate. What do you mean acclimate? You can make more red blood cells. <laughs> yeah, you get you, you get used to it. But your the way your body gets used to it is you you make more red blood cells, right? Your body gets more efficient. At transporting oxygen and stuff like that. So if you're a if you're a uh, uh, Olympic runner and you live in Nigeria and are you going to be working? Are you going to be training down on the seashore or something like that? You're going to be up in the mountains running. Are you going to acclimate up in the mountains, up at elevation, right? Because then when you come to wherever you're going to be running in Tokyo or something like that, you will have it's the equivalent of blood doping. It's legal blood doping. You increase the amount of red blood cells you have that's what they do in blood doping we have big controversy right now because russian athletes got caught many times several times over you know like institutionalized blood doping where they extract blood from the athletes they uh, they try to recover the uh, and they and they uh, extract red blood cells and then the the uh, athletes of course their bodies make it up again and then they replace those red blood cells so it increases the number of red blood cells that they have you know, just before they go into a competition. How do they know that they're, they're doping? Well, the labs measure if you have like, if you have like, you know, 50% more red blood cells than a normal human being would ever have, you know, that they're doping, right? So, but the labs were complicit so that they were faking the results. And, yeah, they, they, there were a number, that whole number of, some of them were blood doping, some of them were performance enhancing drugs. You know, they were all, they were all over the place. They had situations where, where they had like, you know, holes between the lab and the bathroom where they would pass, you know, pass urine samples back and forth. So, I mean, it was just, it's just outrageous. So now they're not, it's supposedly this, this organization that governs uh, 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 maintaining, uh, 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 avoiding uh, issues with uh, uh, performance enhancing drugs has, uh, has just ruled that they can't compete not internationally as under the Russian flag for the next four years. That includes presumably the Tokyo Olympics. Now, Russian athletes that weren't, weren't yeah, they, they, that might get overturned because they're gonna wind up going anyway. But Russian athletes, I don't think, I don't think they'll, they'll do that for, for them for the Russian, for the, uh, uh, so they'll keep an eye on them, that's for sure. But at any rate, Russian athletes that, were on the, that weren't accused of using performance uh, drug weren't involved in the scandal, they presumably could compete anyway, whether Russia go, winds up Russia goes or not, but under a neutral flag. They can't, you know, they they can't uh, compete as Russian athletes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part of what they do, right? 
hazards, hypoxia, loss of night vision. So these are the kind of things that can happen. This is progressively what goes on as you start to lose, as, as you start to live in an oxygen poor environment. And hypoxia, loss of night vision, uh, impaired memory, judgment, coordination, drowsiness, death, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to do it now because I, I don't want to keep you guys here forever. Of course, we can get out a little early tonight, maybe, unlike every any other night that I've kept you here. So, so uh, I have a couple of videos that I use for confined space. One of them is a uh, series of YouTube videos that I've strung together that are the ultimate confined space. How many of you guys saw the movie Apollo 13? Right? You remember what happened to Apollo 13? Apollo 13, they were a lunar, it was a lunar mission. They were in Earth orbit and they were about to, to um, uh, and they had just started on their way to the moon and had an explosion in an oxygen generator. It's the, the oxygen tank, oxygen generator that had to be stirred every once in a while mechanically. Uh, uh, remotely, they press a button, and there was an explosion that blew away the side of the uh, the uh, 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 command module, uh, part of the command module, and they lost power completely. Uh, they had to le shut down the command module, which is the part that comes back, and move into the lunar lander, uh, all three astronauts, uh, so that they could figure out what to do because they were losing power in the command module. They wouldn't have any power to ignite the engines, to the, run the navigation and so on and so forth to get back. So they moved into the uh, into the lunar module and they they were uh, using that system in order to uh, the systems there at the lowest possible power rate in order to preserve power so they have a, a chance to get back. In fact, they were they were in such dire straits that they couldn't just turn around. They had to go back around the moon, come back around in order to prepare the land. During that interim, they were they were uh, they were they ran into all sorts of issues. They're up there in a confined space. One of the things that was happening was the CO2 levels in the capsule were continually rising. So what happens when you start to get to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air? Right, it dissolves in your blood, it acidifies your blood, and its whole body effects. It causes confusion, loss of judgment. Eventually. Uh, it will it, it will cause you to pass out and and eventually die if it builds builds up enough, and it was building up continuously. Literally, one of the problems that they had was they had oxygen re they had CO2 removal systems, uh, including in the command module and in the lunar module, and they had CO2 CO2 removal systems. It's a it's a filter with lithium hydroxide in it. I guess the lithium combines with the carbon dioxide and, and pulls it out of the air. Kind of like if you could have like one the size of Texas, you could probably do they deal with global warming, right? But that's not gonna happen, right? So they, so they have this device, a filter filled with lithium hydroxide that would remove uh, CO2 from the air. Now remember, the lunar module is only supposed to be occupied by two of these guys for a relatively short period of time, a couple of days before they came back. So it was exhausted, the filter in there was exhausted they had a spare filter uh, in the lunar module. Uh, the problem was that the in the uh, that the filter in the lunar module was round, and the filter in the command module was square. So literally, they had to put together a procedure. It's a great scene in the movie about this. But that's a confined space, a typical confined space. A, this is a uh, situation where you have an altered atmosphere, and it can get very, very dangerous. Watch the movie. Watch Chernobyl. Watch that. That's the assignment. That's your post-course assignment after everything else is all done. Watch those two movies. Okay, so pain and sinuses, so on and so forth. Uh, pressure control, high pressure environment, environments, hyperbaric chambers. Every 33 feet of water uh, gains you one atmosphere. That's our, that's our example. Finding nitrogen partial pressure for air, for, in air for a worker, repairing an oil rig at 185 feet under the Gulf of Mexico. So how many atmospheres is 185 feet? 185 feet turns out to be 5.5 atmospheres. That's the weight of the water, plus the one atmosphere of the air that's still there, right? So nitrogen is approximately 71%. So 6.5 times 0.78%, and the partial pressure on nitrogen is 5.1 atmospheres. You could convert that into millimeters of mercury if you wanted to, just 5.1 times 760. So the amount of pressure, the, the amount of nitrogen that's that's being forced into your bloodstream is enormous, right? So my guess is that they use a customized 
uh, 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 air mixture. They don't use anything that it has that has 78%. I don't think they would use something that has 78% nitrogen because their time down there working would be so limited. Nitrogen hazards uh, at various depths. At 100 feet, reason, reasoning measurably slowed at 150 feet. Uh, uh, they don't mention a time here, unfortunately. At 150 feet, jovi joviality reflexes slowed, idea fixation. Uh, 200 feet, euphoria, impaired concentration, drowsiness. And that we were at 188 feet, 185 feet there uh, for that situation. And at 250 feet, mental confusion, inaccurate observation, 300 uh, stupefaction, loss of, uh, of uh, perceptual faculties. Of course, below 300 feet, you don't dive, free dive. You don't free dive and you don't dive with scuba gear. You dive in devices, right? You dive, dive uh, in suits or in uh, 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 bathospheres, I guess. You know, if they still call them that you, uh, structures where the structure is is uh, um, uh, is what's maintaining your safety. And so your atmosphere, the atmosphere inside that structure might only be a couple of atmospheres. Right. Because it's actually structure itself that's protecting you from the pressure at the greater depths than 300 feet. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, that's because that's what's that's what's going on basically. Okay, OSHA leg regulation. There's OSHA has regulations for underground work involving caissons and so on and so forth. Um, uh, this is a dive table that suggests uh, you can read through this. It suggests like the amounts of times, breaks, and so on and so forth. The gas mixtures uh, that uh, you might use for diving at various depths and so on. Uh, uh, now pressure. Uh, you have pressurized containers. They can be anything from a boiler, a steam boiler. Um, we have pressurized steam lines, possibly. Uh, no, not in this building. That, they have a boiler. They have boilers in this building. And they're low pressure steam boilers, 15 PSI, but still can get scolded by steam. Uh, they have Con Ed at its power plant in Long Island City, uh, uh, where they have their giant, big Alice Chalmers generator uh, turn, uh, that's turbine run. They have boilers that produce 750 PSI steam there run those turbines and they go through a couple of turbines going down through I think something like 175 psi that steam is then piped underground throughout the city and winds up going into buildings uh, it used to be that it was not uncommon for them to run that high pressure steam around the building and they actually had a few accidents where that steam would rupture in the building and kill people in the building you know uh, 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 I think there was a telephone company building where that happened Nowadays, the only place where you get that 175 PSI steam, which is enormous, it doesn't sound like a lot, it's an enormous amount of pressure and energy in that steam, heat as well, right? So, so you, I think about six or seven years ago, there was an explosion uh, on 42nd Street by Grand Central that killed a couple of people that were in a van and injured people on a bus and blew up the whole sidewalk and stuff like that. And we've had other explosions. They had one down in, uh, in uh, uh, like around 23rd Street about two years ago, where it didn't injure anybody, but it blew up the street and it blew all the old material that was insulating that 75 year old pipe, which contained asbestos, right? And blew that stuff all over the buildings in the street over there. And they literally shut down that whole area for about three days while they pressure washed all the buildings and flushed all the uh, uh, asbestos fibers and dirt and whatever else, uh, not into the sewers, they captured the water and filtered it rather than put it into the sewers and discharge it. You know, 30 years ago, they wouldn't have done that. They just would have said, well, wait, wait for a good rain. It'll be fine. <laughs> so, don't laugh. This is, world's changing, I'm telling you. The world is changing. I, literally, that would, that's literally how they would have handled it. 30, maybe 40 years ago, maybe not 30, right? So, so that's, that, and things under pressure are enormously dangerous. At 175. So nowadays, in buildings that that most buildings south of 57th Street, south of the park, uh, are don't have their own boilers. They use waste steam from Con Ed coming in at 175 psi. They don't use it at 175 psi. They have a pressure reducing device inside the building in the basement where it goes in and then they they it comes out at whatever they need, five or ten or fifteen pounds per square inch to supply heat the building make hot domestic hot water and so on and so forth. 
uh, uh, so that high pressure piping, you don't see that in buildings, uh, in residential or commercial office space in New York anymore. You also have cylinders uh, that have uh, gases that are under enormous amount of pressure. Um, uh, one of the companies I worked with was uh, located on uh, in Massbeth, just off of 48th Street, where UPS UPS is on 48th Street uh, in Queens on Mass in Massbeth. And this is a side block leading up to 48th Street, 54th Road, and it's a bit of a hill. And this truck that had a whole bunch of cylinders in it came down the street. And, I, and they were almost at the end of the street to 48th Street, the main drag there, when something happened and there was this enormous bang, right? And uh, a hiss, a bang and a hiss, right? And what had happened is they, they somehow or other either it broke by itself or they broke off the, uh, the valve on the top of one of these uh, compressed gas cylinders, loaded compressed gas cylinders, and the thing left the truck and just went away. <laughs> and I swear this is the God's honest truth, the guys in the truck spent an hour looking for that cylinder, and I don't think they ever found it. Apparently, it didn't kill anybody because it would have been in the news, but somebody in the backyard, one of the backyards, or in a plant, the parking lot in a plant or something like that, is right, in the, you know, probably a week later, probably said, where the hell did this thing come from? Right, but you can imagine how this is a missile that's, that's uh, and a big, heavy missile at that. Okay, so what does OSHA say you have to do with these? So if you're on a workplace, what, if you're on a workplace, OSHA comes and does an inspection, and they see these cylinders. What's the first thing they look for when they in these cylinders? The first and second thing, right? They have the cover, right? They want that protective cover on it, and they also want them chained. What's that? Secured? Yeah, they want them chained up or secured in some way so they can't tip over. Okay, that's typical. They'll, that uh, you know, uh, when OSHA comes on a job site, there's certain things they're going to look for. Every for no matter what else they came for, they're going to look for every time. That's one of them. Uh, leak in an unrestrained container. Uh, make by the way, why does OSHA go to a work site? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh, okay. Hang on a second. Uh, if you someone dies, or you get more than two people seriously injured, I think are hospitalized. I think it has to be reported to OSHA. Now it's really strict now. It used to be 24 hours. Now I think it's got to be reported to OSHA within four hours or something like that. You have to call them and tell them about it. They will automatically investigate that, investigate the work site. But in general, if nobody died, how, uh, why does OSHA go to a work site? A complaint. That's it. 90% of their visits are due to complaints. Every once in a while, once in, every once in a blue moon, they get it in their heads to target an industry. In other words, an industry where... For instance, when you remember how we all those cranes falling over New York about 10 years ago? Now all of a sudden OSHA is investigating every crane, every job location, every construction site, and checking credentials on the crane, you know, certification credentials on the crane operators, so on and so forth. So they were targeting crane operators because there was a that industry had an issue. But if you don't have an uh, if you don't have an industry-wide issue, it's almost always generated by a worker complaint uh, and inspection. Right, they don't go around at random. Uh, there's no program where they go around and say, "Oh, you know, yeah, we're going to get to you every 10 years or something like that." Most companies, they never see an OSHA, you know, anyone from OSHA at all. Here you go, missile uh, penetrating missiles injury by sudden oxygen release. Uh, I had a worker, for instance, another pressure issue. Pressure, pressure is an issue in all kinds of situations. Um, uh, we had a um, uh, one of our workers was uh, installing a control device for feeding chemicals to some sort of system and uh, some sort of water system. Don't even remember what kind of water system. And he connected this device. The device had sensors on it and the sensors were, were embedded in PVC, threaded PVC piping, Schedule 80's threaded PVC piping. Did something happen back there? Okay, do you need, uh, yeah, you guys got this on PowerPoint, so I'm not gonna bother to, to get that out of the way. On the recording, it doesn't show. So, so, so uh, don't forget to give me my instruments back, by the way. Don't leave that with, that, with those. So the, uh, so um, uh, uh, there, were, there were electrical panels in the vicinity. So he didn't wanna spray the electrical panels with water in case it leaked when he repressurized the system, turn the valves on and repressurize the system. Thank you, to repressurize the system with water, right? So he had his helper put his hand around the, uh, his hand around the, uh, uh, the uh, connection between the PVC pipe and the galvanized piping. 
and and they pressurized it. The fitting blew apart. Pressure blew the fitting apart because they had thrust, cross threaded the PVC, which is soft. You're supposed to use special fittings to connect plastic pipe to metal pipe, right? Because it's too easy to cross. Number one, if you look at a piece of plastic pipe, threaded plastic pipe, it's got like 17 threads on it, right? And it's that much, it's threaded that far down. If you look at a piece of steel pipe, it's threaded that much. It's only got like a dozen threads on it or something like that. So if you're, if you're connecting this to this, right? Obviously you're not using all the threads in the plastic piping. So it's not rated for what you think it's rated anymore. Plus the soft plastic, it's very easy to cross thread the soft plastic piping. So it came apart uh, uh, instead of like uh, spraying out a little water, it came apart, it broke the guy's thumb. So he was on comp for about three months or something like that. So that's what kind of, that's pressure is dangerous in all kinds of situations. Okay, so suppose a glass cylinder is pressurized 2,200 pounds per square inch, and they are pressurized to these levels or even higher. Not uncommon. In fact, the, 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 the test gases that we have for calibrating instruments that you've seen in the lab, they're usually 1,000 or 2,000 PSI. Uh, after exposure to direct sunlight, and temperature increases 180 degrees. What's the pressure after exposure? Well, you remember that, that uh, this formula, pressure times volume, over temperature in one state, if you change the temperature or the pressure, it's going to be equal to in the new state, it's going to be equal to new pressure, new volume, new temperature. They're going to be proportional, right? So in this case, we don't need the volume because the volume doesn't change. It's a uh, uh, it's a cylinder fixed volume. So the only thing we're interested in is the temperature. So P P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. So we want to know what the new pressure is after it's warmed up uh, uh, to 180 degrees. Well, it's now going to be what it started at 2200 uh, uh, PSI times the ratio of the change in the pressure, uh, temperature. Now, notice we have to convert that to absolute temperature. It's not 70 degrees to 180 degrees, right? That's not the change. The change is really from 530 ranking to 640 ranking, not, not 70 degrees, right? Not just 70 degrees. So, same thing with, with uh, pressure. You know, when we do these calculations, keep in mind that that even though most of the time, real world we're working with just gauge pressure, which is ignore, ignores atmospheric pressure. When you do these kind of calculations, you need to control control that. Uh, fluid, uh, hydraulic fluid sp sprayers, water hoses, pressure washer. Anybody have pressure washer at home? Okay. What's going to happen if what what's what is the pressure? Normal average Home Depot pressure washer. What is the pressure at the tip of the wand? That's coming out of that tip. Do you think? Think it's? You think it's? What's that? No, not that much. Probably 750, 1,000, 100 psi, 1,000 psi possibly, right? Even in a cheap, non-commercial one, a good industrial pressure washer could be 2,000 psi, right? Now, what happens if that's next to your skin when that stuff's coming out of there, right? You're going to be injected with whatever that thing has in it. You literally can you can be injected. So there's a couple of case studies on here where somebody lost a finger because the hydraulic fluid got injected into their finger. So hydraulic lines, pressure washers, uh, paint sprayers, and so on and so forth. In some cases, these in, if they inject it, it gets into your bloodstream, it can be fatal right, in a lot of cases. So you have to be very careful with that's another issue where you have high pressure fluids can be uh, uh, very hazardous in terms of and, uh, and you literally you can have a problem even with the non-commercial stuff, stuff at your home. Okay, there's some, and that's it. Okay, guys, now you don't have to come, to, I'm gonna post the homework, that extra homework with a couple little problems, similar to the ones we just saw now. And I'm going to change that thing where you only have to do one of the two articles for the, uh, for the uh, 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 appraisal, critical appraisal. Yeah. And I, you don't have to come in on Tuesday. I will be here on Tuesday. So if you want to come in because you have an issue with the homework or something like that, and you can't just get it, and, or you have some other issue or something like that, I will come in here. I'll be here at eight o'clock. If I don't see anybody at nine o'clock, I'm going home. That's all up at nine o'clock, right? <laughs> but if you have any reason to come in, I will remind you. If you any have any reason that, that you're having an issue with any of the homework, any other stuff, I'll be here if you want to. If you want to go the over it. Still in there. Um, yes. Will we be able to use Calvin? Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's absolute. Okay. Yeah, as long as you can you have to convert both temperatures to the absolute temperature. It also doesn't matter what measure for pressure you use, whether it's mercury, yeah, as long as you consider it absolute.